All right, folks, thanks for coming online. Thanks for being part of the Therapy Ed uh, series online office hours. Um, appreciate you coming on. So what we're going to talk about tonight is examination differential diagnosis of cervical and upper extremity type conditions um, and uh, kind of talk about it from a licensure exam type prep. All right. So uh, again, I'll be very quick. I have the great honor and pleasure to teach at the University of Incarnate Word. I um, also spent a number of years at Army Baylor and uh, also teach at Texas State University. So I get a great chance to work with students. I also work in a, a very busy um, neurosurgery, pain and physical therapy clinic, seeing a lot of different spine conditions and all kinds of different neuropathic conditions. Um, so I feel like I'm probably one of the most blessed people walking this planet, I get a chance to work with really brilliant students and, and people. And so, and the profession has never been better. So excited for you guys to take this exam, knock it out of the park and keep going with a, a great career ahead. So we are going to, I'm going to pull this up here and we're going to talk very briefly about this. And then we're going to get rolling into some questions, which is why you are online right now. So, um, so we're going to talk about, we're going to kind of cross a little bit of neuromuscular, a little bit of, uh, musculoskeletal as part of this tonight with some of the different cases we're talking about. And uh, really, this is a compare and contrast, which is what clinical practice is about, right? It's about being able to get information, look at examination items, um, think about not only what's the diagnosis, but how is the prognosis of the patient and, how that, and what that means too, all right? Um, everybody go ahead. I hear it again. If you don't mind just muting your mic as you come in, that would be great. All right, so here we go. Um, so we are gonna talk through a little bit of the content outline. So on this exam, as you've been taking practice questions, you probably have realized now that the, there's a lot of questions on what you would not do. Um, and so in clinical practice, if I'm, I'm out there and Leslie and I are in the clinic, I'm gonna say, hey, what would we do with this patient to make them better? But a lot of times the questions that are coming from the FSBPT are coming from a perspective of what you would not do. So just Remember, if you're torn between two answers, um, which happens a lot on these questions, are written so that you can kind of eliminate two and you pick between two. When you're picking between those last two that you've already eliminated the other two options, if there's a safer option, I'm not saying you should always go with it, but think hard about, you know, is that if there are two, two equal treatments, but one's safer than the other, then that might be the path in which you want to go down. All right. So, um, and then again, everything that I'm coming, when I talk about different things, it comes from this exam, uh, from what's called the Federation of State Board of PT content outline. And I'm going to show you a picture of that. So this is the content outline. This kind of gives you an idea of what that looks like. And um, specifically, we're going to talk a lot about examination. This is uh, examination, examination and differential diagnosis. But you can see when it comes to examination, like where do you need to put your effort and your focus? That effort and that focus needs to be on these things that I've kind of highlighted. It needs to be on outcome measures. It needs to be on a histi history and systems review. Remember that it can also include health promotion type examination items, and it's across the lifespan. And this is an example, but if this terminology, if you looked across muscular or neuromuscular, it would be very similar. It's about movement analysis. Being a, you're never going to get asked a straight anatomy and physiology question, but being a, you have to know your anatomy and physiology to translate to get to the movement analysis, joint mechanics, uh, and those measures as part of it. This is an example of a study guide. And just I'll brief, uh, kind of put this up here briefly, but you can kind of see at the top of this study guide, what you see here is, again, the kind of the musculoskeletal anatomy, neck, neck, upper extremity, upper extremity. That's what we're going to focus on. But as far as your overall study plan goes, this is a good chunk of that study plan. Um, going through not just this anatomy, but all your upper and lower extremity anatomy. But when you look at these blocks that break out for neck and upper extremity, it's it's a it's a prep time. And so we're going to hit on these. We're not going to hit on a lot of intervention today, but we are going to hit on uh, examination, differential diagnosis and prognosis. And we'll hit on all these anatomical areas, but do it in a very clinical approach. All right. Um, so. Let's get rolling here. Let's let you guys look at this case study and read on this case study a little bit.
All right. So let's chat in a couple things here. Let's get our fingers working. So what are a couple differential diagnoses you think for this patient potentially? What are some things that could be going on? That's the thing. Radiculopathy, good, okay. All right, so we got it, yep. Radiculopathy, what else potentially? Thoracic outlet, yeah, that could be, nice. Cervical myelopathy, yeah, you'd wanna think potentially, right? Especially with the, the things in the hands going on. Good, very good. So let's, that's kind of where the starting point is. And I, you know, when you approach these questions, I would encourage you to approach them just like you would when you're reading the history and physical exam for the patient you're seeing in the clinic. Read, read the information you have in front of you and kind of work through, okay, what are my top three and what makes the most sense when it comes to these differential diagnosis type questions? So a lot going on, a lot of history here. Um, and we'll talk through that a little bit as we walk through this. So let's think about this. Now with this patient, we think about one, one thing we always want to think about. Remember this test is, this test is about making sure that you're a professional, competent and safe provider, right? So we always have to think about pain referral patterns. So this patient, if we go back here, that pain referral pattern is down the posterior arm. That always gives me a little bit more comfort. Posterior arm, it's on one side. Um, but if that patient would, if it would be, whenever you see this kind of chest or upper kind of up in this area or shoulder that goes into that medial arm, medial down in, almost makes it sound like it might, because this be cubital tunnel, but it's when this is that radiating pain down through here you always want to think about, could the heart be referring? Now, in this case, you're not getting it bilateral, but it doesn't have to be bilateral. It's most common on the left side. This patient we're seeing for a right-sided problem. So I have less concern, but it's always something that I want to think in the back of my mind, given a question or a body chart like this, especially if it's right down in this referral area, have I asked the right questions? You know, does this pain happen on exertion when you're doing something aerobically, or is it more consistent when you're moving your neck, right? Right. So that's one kind of area to think about as you're going through differential diagnosis questions. This is right out of JAM, a really nice article. It's, a, it's an older article, but really still relevant today, even on recent research that, again, these are the things that kind of lead you to think that there's a heart problem. And chest, you know, any type of chest pain that radiates to the arm or especially both arms um, is concerning. And then again, you just ask the questions. Do you have any, is there any shortness of breath? Is there any, are you getting, do you see the patient in excessive sweatiness? all of those things that may be concerning. This patient, and these are real patients that I'm putting up in front of you, did not have any of those things. So they denied that they, there was no chest pain, no diet, they, they weren't diaphoretic when I was watching them. Their respiratory rate was okay. All those things were good. So that made me feel like, okay, that's a good thing. I can, I can worry less. I don't have to worry about the heart. Some things that did stand out in their history is that they did, they were having balance problems though, especially on unlevel surfaces. When they were walking on unlevel surfaces, they were reporting that, yeah, I'm having problems with, um, with getting to, uh, um, you know, kind of keeping my balance. I haven't, in a patient report, I haven't had any falls, but I've had some near falls. And what's a near fall? That means that you stumble, but you catch yourself or you put your hand down on the ground, but you don't go all the way to the ground. So let's do a question here. And I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you exactly as much time as you have when you take this practice exam. So you got a little over a, a little over a minute. Clock is running. Okay, we got about 20 seconds. Oh, and my apologies, everyone. Hold one second here. I'm not helping you out here. It's not question three, but it is a poll. So you should all be able to see a poll now. Go and click in there for me.
Okay, we'll go another 10 seconds. We got about 75% of you pulled in. Go ahead and pull in. Okay, we're sharing results here, folks. So number three, we got a lot of people on Spurlings, right? So that, let, let's take, let's, we're going to go through this and talk about this. This is why I put this question up here, because this is a good example of kind of rule in, rule out, where you kind of have to get in and go, okay, which one of these is most, is going to, would be most sensitive and most helpful in ruling out, right? And so let's take a look at this. So the correct answer here would be upper limb. Oh, and it was on the next slide. My bad. Upper limb neurodynamic test, also called a neuro neurodynamic test, also called a upper limb tension test, a upper limb mobility test, any of those. But it would be this neurodynamic test, upper limb neurodynamic test. So if you didn't, if, because it said neurodynamic, if you didn't get it, it was more of a semantics thing. No big deal. Spurlings would be the other one, right? And here's the thing. All these, the, what's up here, all these things can cause you to have ridiculous symptoms. What's when you go back and look at the literature, though, and kind of go through this, it's, it's and this is again the the this cluster of tests, and a lot and Spurlings is one of those. So if you put Spurlings, that's good, but upper limb tension test, upper limb mobility test, or upper limb neurodynamic test called a lot of different things. This test, when you actually break it down between Spurlings and cervical distraction and um and those kind of things and Valsalva. The most sensitive of these tests is upper limb tension test, neurodynamic test. And it makes sense. Think about it. If, you're, if you've got a hot nerve root and somebody is literally stretching your arm and putting your, depressing your scapula and putting traction on your brachial plexus and your nerve roots, and you can't reproduce their symptoms, that's probably pretty confident you can rule it out. Now, Again, if you put spurlings, don't beat yourself up because that test also is very provocative and that can also reproduce. But it's this is a good example of kind of teasing through these items and going, OK, if I was asked which is most sensitive, which is most specific, what's best for ruling in or ruling out? You don't need to go back and memorize all these different numbers. What you need to think about is when I do that maneuver, what's going to be the most aggressive maneuver, which, again, if you're stretching nerve roots, that's a pretty aggressive maneuver. That's that's a sensitive test. These other combination of tests are also are, are also really good tests. I mean, um, but they're very specific in nature, more specific. And you can kind of see Spurlings is specific, traction, distraction is specific, Valsalva specific. So what's unique about neuro upper limb tension testing? It is very sensitive, helps you rule it out. All right, we're gonna go down here. So now let's give you some uh, objective information from the exam. And I'm gonna be quiet here while you read through some of that a little bit. All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, again, a lot going on. But again, as you read through this, there is a lot of muscles involved, right? There is there's different different things and weakness that we're seeing here, um, and we'll go through that a little bit. Excuse me for one second here. All right, so let's play this Hoffman's. So again, this patient has a positive Hoffman's. And you can see that. And then we go to the other side and this Hoffman's, in this video that I'm showing you is actually positive on both sides. Um, so that's again, what's that indicative of? That Hoffman's test is very, very indicative of cervical myelopathy. So some of you put up their cervical radiculopathy. 
some of you put cervical myelopathy and guess what? Um, that is the case that, uh, that, yeah, what you're seeing in here is that this patient has both cervical radiculopathy as well as cervical myelopathy. And um, here's, here's the take home point from here is that a Hoffman's in and of itself is not real. It, that, that gives you really good information that, that it's suggestive of an upper motor neuron problem. What adds to that is a gait deviation. So our patient had, or has had some, I didn't say it, in the, but has some ataxia. They have a positive Hoffman's test. And then also, do they have these other things? And they're also older than 45. So they've got three of those. That really increases the likelihood once you see that Hoffman's test in combination with gait deviation and age greater than 45, that, uh, yeah, that this would be consistent with myelopathy. All right. So let's do this. I'm going to come back here just a second. All right. We're going to keep going here. Um, now. So as we kind of go through, you see all the different things going on with this patient with myelopathy. Let's come down again here. And with imaging, what do we see in this patient? We see that they've got a uh, very pronounced HMP, um, and that's causing both encroachment as well as central stenosis, which will be consistent with myelopathy. All right. And is there nerve roots that go with that? Yes, there can be, especially the fact that you saw that involvement in that C7 level. And when we think about myelopathy, one thing to really think about is kind of what are the signs and symptoms? This is really a spinal cord review. So I'm kind of getting into neuromuscular right now. So what I'm, what I'm heading with this is you can see that when you review cervical myelopathy is an example of, of a spinal cord problem, right? And so when we think about spinal cord, it's not always tra you know, traumatic. It can be cervical stenosis over a long period of time, which is the most common. And as you look at these different cord syndromes, right? This is a good thing to go back and review. Is the patient exhibiting, um, you know, kind of this brown saccord where they've lost since, uh, pinprick sensation, pain and temperature on one side, but then on the other side, they've lost uh, vibration and, you know, more large myelinated fiber pathways. Is it an anterior cord syndrome? Is this a patient who's exhibiting significant signs of uh, anterior horn cell involvement, cortical path, uh, the, the, um, descending pathways, motor pathways, which is what's giving that Hoffman's reflex and Babinski and clonus and hyperreflexia, or is it purely just vibration and fine touch? And so when you read those questions, kind of teasing through, that could be an additional question coming through on this. So let me ask this question. So what about when we go back to the body chart on this patient, what about the fact that they had left hand, what, what about the left hand and the balance besides the fact, let's go back here. So it makes sense, right, with cervical myelopathy, that this could be the case, right? That they could have these, th this. But the other thing, what else could cause potentially the fact that they've got this numbness and tingling that's more on the palmar side? Besides just radiculopathy or cervical myelopathy, especially if it's palmar side and it's thumb and index finger and those kind of things. Good. Yeah. CTS, right? So in my practice, I see, I, it's not unusual that I'll see patients that have a lot of radiculopathy that have radiculopathy of one or two nerve roots and have carpal tunnel on top of that. And what's unique about this, let's even go a little further. How about the fact that this patient has findings in both hands in the upper extremity and this numbness and tingling in both hands and you know, again, reports periodic weakness in the right arm, forearm, periodically dropping hand objects with the hands. They have decreased balance. What would be some other questions you'd want to ask this patient based on their past medical history? Based on the fact that, and what's unique about their past medical history? Let me ask a better question. Yeah, diabetes. Good job, Catherine. So, so you got a patient who's got upper extremity distal numbness and tingling in both hands and carp and what appears to be potentially carpal tunnel, right? Until and we got to go through the exam and check on that, but they also have a history of diabetes. So where I'm headed with this is could this patient have, what else could this patient have? Especially if I told you they got burning numbness and tingling in both feet and they got atrophy. Yes, peripheral neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy. 
So this is not an easy case. And all of you guys have been out in the clinic. I think most everybody online has been out in the clinic. And that's this is the reality of the clinic, right? I mean, now the exam is not out to trick you. I'm not trying to overwhelm you. But I think when you think about it in terms of what are your differentials with these kind of symptoms and signs, if you can get through this case, you, you know, when you're getting a straightforward history, it makes it a lot easier, right? So, so where I'm going with this is that just being able to kind of look at this body chart and you go, well, oh yeah, radiculopathy. I, I completely agree. That fits with that. But this hand numbness and tingling, that changes the game. That could be cervical myelopathy. That could be carpal tunnel. If it's bilateral in both hands and you ask, what about your feet? And they say, yeah, I'm having burning numbness and tingling in the feet. Then we're in a history with risk factors for, for neuropathy, which is diabetes, alcohol, renal disease, thyroid disease, all those things. Then we have to kind of open our aperture and go, okay, what, what should we do? So if you were asked the question right now, what, what would be, what are some additional examination items that you would want to do in this patient, given the fact that they've got this hand numbness and tingling, you guys kind of hit on it. You would want to do some carpal tunnel tests too, right? And the other thing I'd want to do, considering they have diabetes, is I'd want to go down and do a neuro screen in their lower extremities too, right? I'd want to make sure they had, yeah, good. They want to make sure they have good protective sensation. So go down into the lower extremities with this too. This, so again, this patient uh, in, the, in the long run of this case study uh, ended up having some peripheral neuropathy. I ended up doing four limb, the upper lowers, the whole bit, checking on this patient. All right, so let's let's go back a step. Let's talk about it. I'm going to give you a second here. I'm going to put up the poll. There's a new poll up, and I'm going to let you go through this poll. In this question. Okay, we're about, we got about another 15 seconds and we got about half people pulled in. All right, let's do this. So let's take a look here. I got about seven, uh, about 60% of folks that have pulled in. Let's take a look. We're kind of like, so we got a little spread here, right? That's why, again, why do we pull this up? And in, in where I'm pulling this information, you know, again, the great, the, the resource we're going to see here is the, C, the clinical practice guideline in JSPT on carpal tunnel is really helpful and, the, and when you're studying, going back through CPGs is a really powerful way to help consolidate a lot of information and looking at those summary tables and charts, which can be helpful. So in this case, you know, which of the following evidence has the highest, what has the highest level of evidence for the diagnosis of carpal tunnel? The correct answer here is monofilament and static two-point testing sensation. And again, these are good tests, but when you look at the CPG, again, when we're looking through this, when we're talking about mild to moderate carpal tunnel, the things that are going to be most helpful for you is breaking out a monofilament or breaking out two point and going back through that and taking a look. All right. So, um, oops, and we got somebody in here. Let me share the results. My bad. There we go. Results are shared now. Thank you. Um, so that's a good example of, um, you know, clinically, I love, I, I really, Phelan's tests and carpal compression tests, I use those all the time. And I think they're really, really helpful and they have good psychometric properties. But when it comes to the really getting at the diagnosis, especially helping rule out other things like ulnar nerve problems, um, this is where going the extra step and breaking out a monofilament um, is really, really helpful uh, to, to help with the diagnosis. All right.
All right, let's do this. We're gonna go to move on a little bit. And again, coming down here, these are other things that are supported and have evidence when it comes to diagnosis, but that's grade B evidence, um, you know, level two grade B evidence. So are they helpful? Yeah. But when we're talking about getting at the diagnosis, that getting that highest level of information, we want to make sure that we're looking uh, at a, a monofilament is helping with that. So let's do a little review here. We got a little bit of time. So going back through hand, wrist, and elbow, I'm going to chat in. How many? What percentage of questions do you think are hand, wrist, and elbow questions? Musc out of the musculoskeletal, what percentage do you think are are in in you know? this can be a high or low. And let me ask a, a, a even better question. What percentage of P, PT students, by the time they've graduated, have done a hand, wrist, and elbow evaluation? Yeah, it's low. Let's throw a percentage out there. How many, how, many, how many PT students, when they graduate, have done a full hand, wrist, and elbow evaluation and managed a patient? Yep, throw some numbers out there. Get them going. It's about five to 10%. Yeah, it's about 10%. So now if you have not done a full hand, wrist and elbow evaluation, do not panic. You're in a good place still, but it just means that's an area that you want to go back through. And an area you want to hit on is, is nerve injuries, tendon injuries. What are the, what's the examination items? What's the evaluation differential diagnosis? And then what is the um, treatment? You know, especially flexor tendon protocol is good to go back through going back through splinting for uh, these different neuropathies that we're going to talk about here too. So this patient here, this is carpal tunnel syndrome. This is, is this, do you think this is mild, moderate, or severe carpal tunnel? Yeah, severe, right? You've got clear atrophy there. This hand, right? Once you start to see atrophy and there's weakness in the thenar muscles, you, th that's no law and, and they, and they've lost sensation. If you tested this hand with the Sims Weinstein, you would, they would have very limited protective sensation. Yeah. They would, it would be very clear when you pulled the monofilament out and this can be tricky clinically. And I'm talking to all of you, cause I know you're all out in the clinic. This can be tricky clinically. Cause I see a lot of patients where if I sit there and touch them with light touch down in their hands and goes, it feels similar or different. Is it equal on both sides? Like in this patient, if you look into that body chart and you're just saying, does it feel equal on both sides? Or even sometimes when you say, if it's diminished or it feels equal, let me know. And the patient will say, no, it's, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And then you pull the monofilament out and it's like, they have no concept you're touching them. So, you know, light touch is okay for a quick screen, but it's, it's crude. It's very crude. So, um, so good question, Shannon. The question is with treatment, can a patient regain all the lost muscle in their thenar or eminence? And the answer to that is when you see somebody with severe carpal tunnel like this, they, the good news is if this is decompressed and this is clear indication for surgery, they can regain through collateral sprouting and through maybe potentially some regeneration, but that thumb is going to be weak. It's, it's, and that's why we don't want to treat carpal tunnel at this point, because even with the, you know, uh, the best outcome surgically is um, and treatment wise is moderate. You don't want to wait till somebody's severe because at that point, these axons are not, a lot of these axons are beyond the ability to go back in and regenerate that initial target. And so, yeah, you're going to continue to have some weakness. So great question. Yeah. And that's a great prognostic question is that you want to treat people sooner. And when it comes to mild Carpal tunnel, these are great candidates for PT. There's good evidence out there, you know, for um, what we do with, uh, to treat that. So um, we want to catch people at the earliest point. And that's why, again, monofilament screening is so important. So this is carpal tunnel, severe carpal tunnel. This is what? What's the potential? So this is the involved side. So I asked the, I'm asking this patient, go tip to tip, put your, you know, get, get those tips on there, hold tip to tip. And on this side, left side, no problem. Over here, this is a problem. So throw up a couple of differential diagnoses for me. What, what could cause you to not be able to go tip to tip? Okay. And think about that. That is your flexor pollicis longus, your thumb. And that is your first, your, your index finger flexor digitorum longus. Those are median innervated. So this would be, a, it's still a median nerve problem here. And specifically, this is going to be flexor digitorum uh, profundus of the, the index finger and the middle finger, that is done by your median nerve. So what we know, this is higher up than carpal tunnel. The minute you see that they can't go tip to tip 
and it's on these two fingers, yeah, now we're talking anterior interosseous nerve. Or what's a nerve root that could cause this? What nerve root dysfunction could cause you to have a problem, flexor digitorum profundus and flexor uh, um, pollicis longus, and being able to go tip to tip? Good, C8. Yeah, C8 radiculopathy will cause you to have the same thing. You'll, you'll, it, you'll have this, and everybody goes, oh, it's anterior interosseous nerve. But then you go test other C8 muscles, uh, extent, you know, extensor indices, extensor pollicis longus, and all of a sudden, and even these radial C8 muscles, you're going to notice weakness. So um, you'll see more diffuse weakness if it's more of a nerve root versus if it's just isolated this pinch to pinch right here, that's pretty classic of uh, anterior interosseous nerve. All right. I know we're going into a lot of different, diff I hope, hopefully this is helpful because we're hitting a lot of different nerve problems. So let me go through ulnar because that was brought up. Ulnar, what's different about ulnar is this, this hand of benediction kind of frustrates people because it's like, well, which are we talking is a hand flexing or not flexing? So if you flex, if the, if the question says patient is actively flexing all their fingers and they can flex their last two fingers, their ring finger and their little finger, but they can't flex their first and second finger, that is a median nerve problem. Now, if the hand is passively resting and you're seeing those two fingers curl up like you're seeing in this picture, that would be an ulnar problem. So when you read that question about like Pope's hand or the hand of benediction, is a hand actively flexing or is it rest passively resting? If it's actively flexing and you're saying flex all your fingers and the patient can't flex the last two, you're, you're like, or can flex the last two, but can't flex the index and the middle finger. You're like, okay, that's median. If it's the opposite, if they, if their hand is just resting and it's curled down passively, that's an ulnar problem. All right. Because again, those are innervated by your, these last two fingers are ulnarly innervated flexor digitorum profundus. And that's the cool thing about finger, the tips of your fingers, when you flex them, this is median, this is ulnar. You can get a lot of information just by an asking somebody to flex their fingers, the tips of their fingers down. All right. Um, all right, let's dive into this one a little bit. And I'm going to restart the poll for you. All right, we're going to go about another 10 seconds. We got about third, we'll go back to, we're going to go another 20 seconds. We got about 40% of you that have pulled in. I want to make sure you get time. There's a lot of information here. So we're going to go, we're going to go a little longer. Give everybody a chance to pull in. All right, here we go. So I'm going to share the poll. All right, so we got a little spread here going on. Yeah, not an easy question, right? Because this is this is a 
this isn't just radiculopathy versus mononeuropathy, right? This is throwing in the plexus into it and you're like, oh yeah, I got to get back into some of those plexus muscles and take a look, right? So in this case, this patient has, um, they're, they uh, interesting have an interesting history, right? A traumatic history. They went to get a flu shot and then uh, they had a flu shot in their arm about three weeks ago, but they've had this, in, this a lot of weakness in their arm, right? They got numbness and tingling on the uh, outside of the shoulder that radiates to the lateral arm. Um, they're getting this uh, and also kind of three plus to four plus out of five manual muscle testing, the deltoid super infraspinatus, biceps, brachioradialis, and wrist extensors. So they've got involvement in axillary nerve. They've got involvement in suprascapular nerve. They've got involvement in muscu, uh, musculocutaneous nerve, brachioradialis, wrist extensors, radial nerve. They got a lot of different nerves involved, right? And so when that happens, the key here is, is that what they don't have is they don't have any scapular winging, right? They have no scapular winging. That's really telling when it says there's no scapular winging, because what that tells you is, is that the root level is not involved. And I'm going to show you a chart to reemphasize that here in just a second. So um, the correct answer on here is, we're going to go to here, is it upper trunk brachial plexopathy. And I'm going to show you a picture that'll help reinforce that anatomy and talk about some strategies to help you kind of to get at this, to, to think about it from uh, that perspective. So um, this gives you a nice picture of kind of that idea. So dorsal scapular nerve, that's your rhomboids, right? The rhomboids, inner, that would be, that would cause scap scapular winging. So if this was a root level problem, like a C5 or C, a combination C5 or C5 or 6 radiculopathy, especially C5 radiculopathy, your dorsal scapular nerve is going to be involved in what's going to happen. You're going to see some scapular winging. If you get at the root level, what else can happen? What nerve comes off the root level besides the dorsal scapular nerve that's up here? Good, long, thora uh, yep, long thoracic, which gets C5, C6, C7, and that also causes scapular winging. So when we think about scapular winging, you think about dorsal scapular, rhomboid weakness, long thoracic, right, serratus anterior weakness, um, a nerve root itself. I see a lot of patients who have a C5 radiculopathy or a C6 radiculopathy, and because that feedback into these muscles that have that innervation, they'll have winging. So next time you see somebody with radiculopathy, make sure you take that shirt off and, and look, have them move. Don't be, you'll, you, you'll be amazed to see that, yeah, there's, if there can be some winging. The other thing that, cause what's it, there's one other thing. So you can have a nerve root, C5, C6 nerve root problem. You can have dorsal scapular nerve, or you can have long thoracic. What's the other thing that can cause scapular winging? One other nerve problem. And I'll give you a hint. It's not a peripheral nerve. Nice. Spinal accessory nerve. Yep. Good. So yeah, good. That spinal accessory nerve, right? It innervates all your traps. If your traps are denervated um, and don't have a nerve source, yeah, you're going to see a lot of scapular winging. So just remember that if you're seeing scapular winging in a question, it tells you it's a, it's a proximal problem, right? Right at the root level, or it could be spinal accessory nerve if it's a neurogenic cause. Now this up here, if it's upper trunk, here we go. Upper trunk problems, you won't see scapular winging, but what you will see is you're going to see infraspinatus, supraspinatus weakness, rotator cuff weakness here. Because of that division coming down into the posterior core, guess what? Everything that's C5 and C6, so believe it or not, the lats could be weak. Guess what? More rotator cuff weakness because of the superior and inferior uh, subscapular nerves. So you're going to have problems with internal and external rotation. Axillary nerve is going to be weak. Deltoid is going to be weak. What else is going to be weak? Radial C6, C5, C6, or yep, C5, C6 muscles. So the supinator is going to be weak. Wrist extensors are going to be weak. Brachioradialis is going to be weak. You can see where I'm going with this. Biceps is going to be weak. Lateral cord. So when you see, not don't see scapular winging, but all the other C5, C6 muscles are involved, then you can feel confidence at the trunk level. If it's just at the cord level, what are we going to see? We're going to see weakness in the biceps, and we're going to see that coming down into your median nerve innervated muscles. So some of your median nerve innervated muscles will be involved too, but we're not going to see this posterior. We're not going to see deltoid weakness. We're not going to see radial nerve weakness because that comes from the upper trunk coming down into that division. All right. So um, let me ask this question. What do you think is going on with this patient? 
What what medically do you think is going on with this patient with this history? Anybody want to take a guess? Chat it in. Because this is a unique history, right? This isn't like this isn't like they were in a motorcycle accident and they had an upper trunk problem. So what's unique about that history? Yeah, you think good. It could be yeah, Guillain Barre syndrome. It is. It is. You're spot. You're spot on from the perspective that this is a. A, 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 a neuritis problem, an inflammatory neuritis. And the fact that it happened after some type of injection almost kind of lets you know that this is an autoimmune problem, right? So this is an auto, this is some type of reaction, inflammatory reaction like Guillain-Barre. Now this patient, because it's isolated to just this arm and just this part of the plexus, what we call that is a brachial neuritis or you can call it, it's also called Parsonage Turner syndrome. Yeah, it's a tough one to remember. It's also called neuralgic amyotrophy, but it's brachial neuritis. That's the easiest way to remember it. So patients who have a traumatic presentation and they come in and these patients will be super painful. They come in and they say, I, I my pain is 12 out of 10. I have this horrible pain. Cause you can imagine if you're having uh, some type of virus or some type of irritation thing attacking your plexus, it's not only going to be numb and tingly and weak, it's going to be painful, very painful. Um, and that's what these patients have. And they, you ask them, you're like, well, when did you fall? When did you have trauma? I didn't have any trauma. That's when you want to start asking, have you had a cold lately? Have you had any problems with um, any, uh, any shots, any immunizations, anything like that? And this is a patient who, again, you want to try to treat like you would with Guillain-Barre, get them on plasmapheresis, get them on corticosteroids to try to decrease that inflammation. So this patient... If you're the first person to see this patient, they, you know, or they've been referred to you and they haven't been on those kind of treatments, they need to be on those type of treatments. So, um, and this, they get weak quick because you're basically just killing off axons within that plexus. So it's really important that they get treatment as soon as possible. Um, and again, where does it typically happen with brachial neuritis? It's the upper trunk. It can be isolated to these other nerves, like your suprascapular nerve, your long thoracic nerve. We see that commonly in all your axillary nerve. So that's the most common places where you see it involved. All right. That is brachial plexitis. Now let's do one. We're going to finish here. So, um, with, with this, another thing about your, how do I, you know, you're like, well, what about these plexus questions? How do I get them? So big picture. Scapular winging, you know, it's at the root level. If it's suprascapular nerves involved and everything distal that's C5 and 6, it's a trunk problem. If it's just musculocutaneous nerve, median nerve, then we know it's a lateral cord. So let's go down to the lower trunk. So this is a little bit more difficult, but the difference here is, is that if I'm seeing both C8 and T1 weakness, right? So if I'm seeing first dorsal interossei, which has is kind of more T1, and I'm seeing abductor pollicis brevis, and I'm seeing all these C8 T1 combination of muscles down in the hand, meaning this, if this, if this hand has no or little movement, that's C8 T1, right? And I got this really weak hand. My question to you, if I think this is a lower trunk problem and I'm seeing a bunch of hand weakness, what's a good proximal? C8 muscle that you could go look at that would also make you go, okay, yeah, this is more getting closer to the root level. So I'm telling you, this patient has all this weakness down in their ulnar and median hand innervated muscles. And you're like, this doesn't make sense. I'm not quite sure this could be something going on at the, at the plexus. What's another muscle that you could go up higher up by the shoulder and test? Nice. Awesome job. Pec, right? Because the medial cord feeds into your medial pectoral nerve and that medial pectoral nerve innervates your pec minor. And it also innervates the sternal portion of your pec major. So if you're seeing pec weakness, especially pec minor weakness, because that's predominantly C8 T1, um, almost purely. Uh, and then, then you're thinking, yeah, this is higher up. This could be a trunk problem, or this could be a combination of two nerve roots that are involved. So don't know, you know, again, I always just say, I always think if I'm thinking C8, T1, I'm going to go look at pecs. If I'm thinking C5, C6, I'm going to look at scapular winging, and then I'm going to move into the rotator cuff, and then I'm going to move into those specific muscles further down as part of that. All right, folks, I hope this was helpful. 
Um, we we got done a little bit early, so we got it's it's about almost ten tell, and I am open for any questions. So if you have some questions, please. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop for one second because we'll record this and put this on YouTube. But let me go ahead and stop that.